Well, this is Dr. Jay Smith, and back again is our good friend Mel. You all know Mel, that smiley face. He's supposed to be on vacation. He refuses to do so. He's so excited by what has happened. And I think what really perked up his his um, energy was what happened you know, with the video we have just put up with Paul. Paul from London. And Paul is one of those discoveries by Mel. Mel, well, or both and, but Paul came to Mel, Mel came to Paul. And the reason why Paul uh, is even known by us is because of the comments. Remember, we've always said, we love your comments and the ones that are serious, we want to get a hold of, we want to run with you. It turns out that Paul has been working on this particular thesis, this Jerusalem thesis for three years. That's an awful long time. Now, does he have a degree in this? No, he doesn't. Does he need a degree? No, he doesn't. For people, just stop and think. For those of you who are Muslim, did Muhammad have a degree? No, he didn't. Did he have, did he even know how to read and write? No, he didn't. Yet every one of you is listening to Muhammad. And in the same token, it tends to be the people who don't have the degrees who actually go out and do the research like Dan Gibson. Does Dan Gibson have a degree? No, he doesn't. Does he know an awful lot more than Dr. David King, who did have a degree, who spent all his time in, in, uh, in libraries in London? Obviously, who's done the better work? Well, obviously, Dan Gibson did because he actually went to the places, went to situ, uh, in situ, and he found, the, he found his discoveries. That's why people like Paul, lovely guy, first time I met him yesterday, and yet what Paul has put up there, and I just put up earlier this morning, what Paul put up there and what he has done, I have, got, I have seen no one who has done this yet. No one has bothered to go back to the Jerusalem itself. Now, there are many of you in the comments below are saying, yes, this makes sense. Yes, we've been trying to tell you Jerusalem. Look back at Jerusalem because everything comes from Jerusalem. Well, Mel has known this for a long time, and Mel, you're you're on board now. Even though even yeah. though you're not supposed to be here, you're supposed to be enjoying yourself somewhere, hiking and going all over the landscape. You've come back, uh, and you're in a hotel room just for this recording, and you want to talk and actually embellish what Paul did yesterday, right? And so, what we're going to do? I've asked Mel to just put out his computer. This is the great thing about the technology. You're a three thousand miles away from me. I'm sitting here in in my my office. <laughs> and you're in a hotel room. So what you're gonna do, Mel, is you're gonna actually take off from what Paul did and show you some other ideas, some new material, some other research that also supports the Jerusalem thesis. And we're gonna call it that, the Jerusalem thesis. That's what yeah. Paul named it. We're gonna name it that way. And we're gonna continue with this Jerusalem thesis. This is gonna be a, a whole panoply of new ideas that are gonna be coming out. This is the first, uh, really, we've only put out about three videos on this channel on the Jerusalem thesis, what you and I did with, uh, with Al-Fadi uh, about a week and a half ago, what Paul did yesterday and what you're doing now. But I'm hoping we're gonna have a whole slew of Jerusalem thesis videos. So over to you, Mel, help us and give us, bring us back to Jerusalem and tell us what else you found about Jerusalem and what else you found about biblical de theology and also what you also found about the Bible itself concerning what now Islam has borrowed. And that's what we're saying. Islam has borrowed almost all of these ideas. Okay, so obviously we're talking about the Jerusalem thesis and a big part of that thesis is the Masjid al-Haram and where exactly that is. Um, so according to the Jerusalem thesis, the Masjid al-Haram is to be found on the Temple Mount. And there are lots of good arguments for why that is the case. And uh, these are based on references that we can find in the Bible and how it corresponds to what it says in the Quran. And we can also look at various geographical evidence as well. Now, if we look at reason one, a very important reason why we can say that it is the masjid on the Temple Mount, it's to do with the link with Abraham. So in Genesis, it refers to Abraham building an altar on Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac upon. It says, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. What's really significant is that when we say that word Mariah in Arabic, what do we say? It is Marwa. Marwa is Mariah. That, um, and so that's that's a, a huge link. Now, um, this so will be something I will... 
what you're saying, Mel, is the pronunciation of Mariah would be Marwa. So it's just the same pronunciation, the same word, but pronounced as an Arab pronunciation would uh, Arab would do it. Yeah. And something I will cover in, in a future video is the fact that the Arabs had a big um, obsession, really, with Abraham for obvious reasons that, that went back centuries. So this place where Abraham brought Isaac to sacrifice him was hugely significant, not just for Christians, not just for Jews, but it also was significant for these Arabs as well. So this is a very important place. And if we think about the significance of the story, Isaac is a symbol of faithfulness to God. Um, an altar is built and Isaac is put on the altar. And just at the last moment when he's about to obey God to sacrifice Isaac, an angel appears and offers a ram instead of the boy. And obviously, when Christians see that story, we see something extra because we see the figure of Isaac and the figure of the ram as a prefigurement of Jesus, who is the ultimate sacrifice. So this is a very significant story. Yeah, I'm going to go a picture up here. Here's a picture of the rock itself. This is a picture of what the rock looks like today. And isn't it the tradition, Mel, that this rock is where the sacrifice was uh, for of Isaac? This is where he was going to be sacrificed. Yes, um, this is the tradition that goes back uh, literally thousands of years. Um, it is one of the most significant locations. And um, there's lots of markings in that rock. It's, it's actually also the location of the Holy of Holies where they kept the Ark of the Covenant and there are various grooves in the very rock and and uh, th those that have, uh, let's say, stewarded that area or looked after it over the centuries have been very careful to keep that rock the way they had it centuries ago because okay. it was so, so sacred, so that. significant. What the Muslims have done since the Dome of the Rock was then constructed in 691, we're talking about 7th century AD, they then read fa fashioned the story to take away the idea of Abraham and Isaac, and they put it to this is the rock from which Muhammad ascended the seven heavens. And even some yeah. say, if you look carefully, you can see the footprint of Muhammad there as if he pushed up from there himself, as if he, he jumped up to the seven heavens. Now, ironically, this is what Islam does with anything. And this is some, a good way to introduce us. Islam takes what is already there and they introduce their own narrative. They introduce their own story. They introduce that which makes sense. We've just mentioned this a, n a number of episodes ago, where if you go to Mecca today, there used to always be one Jamarat. Now there are three Jamarats. And the reason why is because to accommodate the huge crowds that are coming, one Jamarat throwing stones, 49 or 72 stones, you hit too many people. They've had to aggrandize it with three. But if you go to Mecca today and ask, why are there three Jamarats? The new narrative, which has just been around since 1980, so we're talking only 40 years, is that those are all to commemorate the three times that the devil came to hassle Abraham. There's the new narrative, and it's just come out in the ninth, in the 20th and 21st century. If they're still creating these new narratives, why are we surprised they didn't do the same thing, with the, in this case, with the rock, which was where the Temple Mount was, is you're going to say later on, it's where the Holy of Holy was for Jerusalem. I'm sorry, for the Jews. Now, it has now become the place that Muhammad went to the seven heavens. Yep. Okay, so when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, if we look at another uh, reason why it's significant, it's the place where Solomon built the first temple. So as you can see from Second Chronicles 3.1, then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Arona the Jebusite, the place provided by David. Now, perhaps many of your viewers don't know what a threshing floor is. Perhaps maybe farmers might know what that is. But that's a place where you separated the wheat from the chaff. And obviously that's a very symbolic thing to do because it's a symbol of the judgment day when uh, God judges the good from the bad, the sheep from the goats. So in Judaism and in also in Christianity, 
it was one of the places that was believed to be where the judgment day would occur and all the people would be gathered at that location. So it's a very significant place. And I think I have said all of that there. So this is the location of the apocalypse. And what's interesting in Islamic tradition, you see that very belief, the idea that this is going to be the location of the apocalypse. Now, uh, reason number two is the idea of the Kaaba itself. The Kaaba is a cube. Well, at least it's meant to be. The word means cube, but I'm sure, Jay, you're aware that the Kaaba that's in uh, Mecca isn't actually technically a cube. It only looks a little bit like a cube, but it's actually a, a cuboid, perhaps you'd call it. I'm just going to put the picture up right here. Take a look at the picture. You can see it is really a rectangle. It is not exactly a cube. So why is it being called the cube? Because that's what Kaaba means in Arabic. But let's have a look at what the original Kaaba was, the, the original cube. So if we turn to Exodus 26, it talks about the tabernacle in the wilderness. That is like the original temple. And it was essentially a large tent that the Jews would put up and the Ark of the Covenant was kept in the end of it in a place called the Holy of Holies. It was a cubic room, as we'll see in a moment, and God's presence was believed to be in there. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see very clearly that cube shape. And only the high priest could go in there. Okay, so if we take a look at further references, we can see in Second Chronicles 3.3, we have the dimensions. Um, the portico at the front of the temple was 20 cubits long across the width of the building and 20 cubits high. Now, obviously, that's two dimensional, but it suggests a cube. And this is confirmed by another reference elsewhere. He prepared the inner sanctuary within the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 wide and 20 high. He overlaid the inside with gold, pure gold, and he also overlaid the altar of cedar. So this is really a slam dunk. The cube, the, the Kaaba, was originally associated with the Jewish tabernacle. And, you know, many of the viewers may not be familiar. What exactly do I mean by the Ark of the Covenant? Jay, what, 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 how would you explain the Ark of the Covenant to those who may not be familiar with that? Well, the Ark of the Covenant is what they would take with them as God's presence with them. Whenever the Jews who were nomadic at that time, they had to move from place to place to place. The Ark of the Covenant is what they would carry, and they would then take that Ark with them so that God's presence went with them from place to place to place. Yeah, exactly. And if I, if I understand it correctly, the the Ten Commandments were kept within that, uh, within that box, that Ark, and that was... The reference to the covenant so this these 10 commandments were kind of a reminder of god's presence um so obviously a very important place and so interestingly in jewish tradition the ark of the covenant which is that container where the 10 commandments were kept the markings underneath it are still to be seen in that rock on the temple mount um, because they, they were eventually kept in the holy of holies in in the temple on that uh Temple Mount, so it's really significant, and that links again back to what we spoke about with Abraham and Isaac. Reason three is to do with the Hajj, which means pilgrimage, and this is something that Paul covered um, uh, relatively briefly. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place He will choose, at the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. This is from Deuteronomy 16. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord God has blessed you. Now, in the original Hebrew, the name for that is Hag. So Hag Hakatzir, the festival of unleavened bread, Hag Ha Shavut or Shavot, and Hag Ha Sukkot. But when we say that in Arabic, that word Hag becomes Hajj. And actually, you you um, got a phone call, you, you were telling me, from Murad on this very uh, just a, word. Just a number of, actually, 
I just uh, about a half an hour ago. You won't believe this. I mean, this is how God works. It's just providential. Murad called me up uh, on using WhatsApp, and he wanted to talk to me about some of the things he's discovering. And I and he just said that he saw the video that we put up with Paul yesterday, and he said, you know, Jay, that idea of hudge and hug, you are absolutely correct. It all depends on where you put the dot. If you put the dot above the letter or you put the dot below the letter, it becomes either a G or a J sound. And he says, in places even today, places like Yemen and in Egypt, the hajj is still hug. It's still, they're still using the G. Everywhere else they use the J sound, but they still use the G in those two countries in Arabic. So even today there is a confusion or there is, they just agree to disagree uh, that whether it's a G or a J. So this obviously the Hebrew hug what is the equivalent to what has now become in most Arabic speaking countries, Hajj. Yep. Now, so if we look at that as well there, with the festival of unleavened bread, they have a sacrifice of a goat, as you can see, but that corresponds also with Eid al-Adha, which happens at the end of Ramadan, if I'm correct. <laughs> um, so there's another correspondence. And also, We've mentioned about the, the G to the J, but what's also interesting is that in terms of Arabic etymology, according to Odin Lafontaine, the, the word HJJ actually just means to argue in Arabic. So they borrowed the actual meaning from the Hebrew. It wasn't there in the Arabic. And the other thing which is also interesting is a person who makes the pilgrimage specifically to Jerusalem is called a Hagag, which obviously would be a Hajjaj if we say it in the Arab, Arabic way. And we all know who Al-Hajjaj is, the person who was Abdul al-Malik's right-hand man. So that is very significant. So what's interesting here, we have the word Hajj. It comes from Hebrew and it was connected with the Temple Mount. And I think these are very good reasons to suppose that this is where um, the original Masjid al-Haram is, and this is a good part of the argument, I would say. Um, now, uh, another aspect of this, if we look at the Feast of the Weeks from the Mishnah, um, it prescribes circling the temple seven times on the seventh day. So we see a Hajj, we see the circling, so it's, it's, a, it's a great match. Um, we're on to reason four now. The idea of the house of God. So I'm sure the Christian viewers will be familiar with this. Pretty much um, in lots of parts of the Bible, it refers to the temple as the house of God. Uh, probably the most common one to most of the viewers would be what Jesus said. My house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. And there's many other references to uh, the house of God in in the Bible in reference to the Temple Mount. So if we move on to reason five, Baca, um, we find in the Quran, the first house created for mankind at Baca, 396. So this is something that Paul mentioned in passing, that it comes from Psalm 84. If you look at the references in bold, they all relate to the Temple Mount. So you have the courts of the temple, you have the altar, you have the reference to the house and the Valley of Baca is really a symbol of the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So that's the, the link there with Jerusalem once again. I don't know if you want to say something on that, Jay. Well, and, and Paul did bring this up and this is something we need to underline. I noticed that one or two people in the comments also brought this up. Baca was always a place that you stopped on the way to Jerusalem. It was a rest stop. It was a place to get your energy up before you actually went to Jerusalem with all that what that entailed. And so Becca is well known in the Bible, and it is not Mecca at all. If In fact, the, there are three different references, three different places from biblical context where Becca could be. Today, the most popular one would be in Lebanon, uh, the Baca Valley. But certainly, this is so well known in the Bible to, uh, to try to assume, uh, Muslims trying to assume that this is Mecca. Obviously, you need to look and see. Becca, chapter 3, verse 96, is referring, uh, if the Quran, it is taking the word that is taken out of straight out of the biblical context of a place as a rest stop on the way to go to the pilgrimage there in Jerusalem. Yep. 
Okay. Reason six is to do with shaving heads. So obviously, uh, when Muslims go on Hajj, they shave their heads. So an objection might be to to a Jewish location is that Jews are not known for shaving their heads as Muslims do on Hajj. You can see a reference to heads shaved in Surah 48, 27. So how does that link with the Bible? Well, we find it here. Isaiah 22, 12. In that day, the Lord God of hosts called to weeping and mourning, to baldness and putting on sackcloth. Well, I'm, I'm in good company there. Don't have to do much shaving of the head. But um, we can see that the... The, uh, the early Muslims obviously read the Bible and they decided that that's going to be part of their ritual. Perhaps the rabbinical Jews may have disagreed with them. Maybe they, they had different customs. But you can see in the picture down there um, that the you know Muslims dress entirely in white. And uh, Jay, do you want to talk about that aspect of it? Yeah, I mean... Uh... This, this is what's fascinating. If you look, if you look, uh, you've got the picture of the sackcloth there, and then over here you have what they call the ihram, I-H-R-A-M. The ihram is what all Muslims use today whenever they do the hajj. And the reason why, and Muslims are very correct on, clear on this, the reason why they take it, if you're flying in from another country, you fly into Mecca, before you get off the plane, you're supposed to change into the ihram. And it is just a bland piece of white cloth all not all as one piece that they wear on on themselves so that everyone is equal that there are nobody there this is to show a sign of humility before god that there no one is rich no one is pure uh, poor no one is white black or or any other color you are all white one color one piece of cloth and therefore there's no distinction between one and the other that's the re in the meaning that they give today now that comes straight out of judaism again the sackcloth that you see in Isaiah 22. The sackcloth is usually the, exactly the same way. It's to show obedience and it's to show humility before God so that nobody yeah. is any different between God. So even the rich and the poor wear the same sackcloth and it's very rough. It is very, it's not supposed to feel good. It's, you're not, and, 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 and there's no refinery about it. There's nothing that shows, that can show you off because you are nothing before God. And ironically, the Muslims have taken the same idea that comes that was used there in Jerusalem, and now they've applied it to Mecca, possibly to Petra in between. So that idea that this was something new by Islam, no, Islam has just borrowed what is already there. Again, proving that the Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem uh, thesis that you and Paul and Otto Lafontaine are coming off with, uh, coming up with, is absolutely cr crucial. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at, okay, we've looked at the biblical reasons, but we're going to look at the geographical ones and the historical proofs for this. So something that you will have seen if you looked at the video on the Temple Mount, the uh, we did a video, I think it was about a year ago, on the Dome of the Rock, um, but you will notice that um, it's built for circumambulation, walking around it. So that's That's a key there. But is there a connection between that and Judaism? Obviously, we've seen uh, some references to the idea that Jews uh, circled on the seventh day seven times. But what about the direction? Is it clockwise or anti-clockwise? Does that co correspond? Okay. So, in Judaism, the word for circumambulation is hakafa, which means to circle or go around, and it's a Jewish word. A Hebrew word I should say um, so this is the rock that we have referred to with the, the various markings um, as you can see there on Sukkot the readers platform is circled on each of the seven days of the holiday this spot on the Temple Mount is the exact location of the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was once kept and also if you think about the story of uh, Jericho they walked around that seven times on this uh, on the seventh day and then the walls came crashing down and they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant as well to boot and in, not incidentally they they walk around it anti-clockwise which is exactly what Muslims do as well so in Judaism starting things from the right side 
is considered to be important, since the right side is the side of chesed, which is kindness, while the left side is the side of gevura, which is judgment. So it's kind of like mercy versus judgment. So that's why Jews go around anti-clockwise. And you can see, once again, the copycats have copied the Jews here. And that reinforces the idea that this is where they've taken their ideas from in Jerusalem, from the Temple Mount. Well, so are you, I, I, this is this is what I this is the, what we all are looking for. This is what many of the people in the comments are are uh, thanking you for, Mel, you and Paul, uh, and Odin. What is his name? Odin Lafontaine. Yep, Odin Lafontaine. Odin Lafontaine. The three of you have really uh, worked on this type of material and are coming back and looking and, and coming out with proof after proof after proof after proof. Now, these are green papers. We're putting them out there as as suppositions, but it, it seems like it's underlying almost everything we've been at saying. Islam is nothing. There's nothing original in, in Islam. We have noticed this. We have known this. We have said this about the Quran itself, uh, that one of the things that uh, we have I've been saying for years is that so much of the Quran is borrowings from Jewish apocryphal writings written in the second, third, fourth, fifth, up until the sixth century, and also Christian Syriac Aramaic writings, uh, many of them lectionaries, uh, discussions that were meant to be discussions, never meant to be a, a literary piece, had they been borrowed and put into a book. But when you take it from the Syriac Aramaic or Aramaic Syriac, you then deform it and the arabic then had all kinds of problems because it did not it could not have accommodated the script could not have accommodated something that was so sophisticated that it was coming out of these lectionaries now what you have done here you've looked at seven things i, I count i think there's seven i think i'm correct on that you started with moriah and here's a picture of the map that paul put up let's just put it up there so you can see where moriah is scopus. there you can see where scopus is the two different mountains and you can see where the kidron valley is in between you can even see where gehenna was now did you notice gehenna 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 there's the g and the j confusion of the g and the j so gehenna it would be the hero gehenna has not been changed to gehenna it's still the same idea of hell so paul brought that up there as an afterthought in the in the video we did yesterday when you look at it it actually is a straight straight borrowing out of what the jews had already done so that's what's fascinating. You went to Solomon's temple and you looked at the, the fact that in Solomon's temple, you have this threshing idea of, of, and for those who don't know what chaff means, that's the stuff you don't use. You get rid of the stuff that is superfluous and you keep the wheat. So that's why you winnow it. And that's why you, in threshing it, you then take away and let the chaff blow away with the wind, but you keep the wheat because that's what can be usable. That's what you, is being done there in uh, the threshing floor that's there in the temple. Your second thing you brought up was, was Kaaba, and I love what you did that. Now, Paul did it earlier, but you really, I think, underlined it much better, looking at this idea that the Kaaba is the same word that we would use for cube. And fascinating, looking at the looking at the, what the Muslims have done, they've taken this idea of the cube, but they even keep it to a cube. It's not really a cube. What's the word you give it? What's the name you give it? A cuboid. A cuboid. Cuboid. But it's not, yeah. four, it's not 20 by 20 by 20, as you have saying, 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. The Bible made it very clear that this Holy of Holies that's there at the end of the temple that was there that, uh, that uh, Solomon built, that is actually a cube. And that's where is right where the Temple Mount is today. Isn't that fascinating? So that Holy of Holies has now been taken, lifted. They tried to reproduce it possibly in Mecca. It looks like it, from what uh, Gibson is saying, it was probably there in Mecca. But then it was much more recreated there in the 8th century because in Mecca. And the, they didn't get it quite right. They didn't get it by 20 by 20 by 20. It's a cuboid. It's not actually a square like it should have been, which is probably what happens whenever you try to take something and try to mimic it. You then mock it by mimicking it because you don't get even the dimensions correct. Now, then you went to the third thing, and that is the hutch. And that's the idea of the G and the J. The G and the J are interchangeable. The hug that you have in Hebrew, and you talk about the three feasts, they're all there at the temple, are they not? They're all there in Jerusalem. That has been recreated uh, by Islam as the hajj, which even includes the seven circumambulations. I'm sorry, going this way. It actually goes anti-crockwise, as we now found. It goes the other direction because it's for going towards that which is kind, that which is going towards the kindness rather than the judgment. 
Interestingly, the Muslims have done the same thing. But ask a Muslim, why seven? How many times have I asked Muslims, why are you going seven times around? And I've never bothered to ask them, why are they going anti-clockwise? I'm going to do it from here on out. Thanks so much, Mel. Because the <laughs> Jews did this, because this is what was done in Jerusalem. The fact that you sacrifice there. They have a they have a whole they have a whole plane for sacrifice there in Mecca today. That was done at the temple. And it was yeah. all done at that temple mount where now the Dome of the Rock sits. Now Number four, you then went into the house of God. The house of God is well known in the Bible as the temple. And that's why you know, when Jesus drove out the money changer, because this, how dare you desecrate the house of God in Luke that you put there. And then you went into number five, Becca, and the idea that Becca is to be Mecca. No, it's not, folks. We know where Becca is. Get it straight. Get your history straight. Get your the geography straight. Look and see where Becca is. It's on the way to get to Jerusalem. It was a rest stop that is well known by the Jews. I didn't know this about the shaved heads. Maybe you like it's because your head is bald, but I, <laughs> you are right. They do shave their heads. That's right. So why do they do that? Because this is what they did in the Jewish tradition. This is what you do when you go to pilgrim, you shave your head. What's as fascinating too is the ikram, the, the sackcloth uh, that the Muslims call today ikram is exactly what the sackcloth that they would do on pilgrimage, the Jews. Nothing new under the sun, they've just borrowed it. And then of course, the you, oh, actually I jumped ahead, the circumambulation going the anticlockwise, the hakafa that you refer to is actually what the Muslims have done today. In almost everything we're finding, Islam has done nothing new. There's nothing new in the sun. And stop and think, Mel, when you make up a religion or when you take that which is already there and you want to make and retain that which pe the memory of what people already know, because you do want to retain that. So you want to retain the sackcloth, you want to retain the second boundaries, you want to retain the, the cube, you want to retain also the Safa and the Marwa who are running back and forth. You want to retain all this. You then take it, but you don't really have any idea why, if you've lost that memory, you're still doing without even understanding why. And yet today, when I ask Muslims, why is it you don't just go three times around the Kaaba? Why don't you go clockwise? Why do you go anti clockwise? I've never bothered to ask them that question. I Muslims just don't seem to know. Even the experts don't seem to know. They keep on saying, well, because Abraham did. Well, yes, okay. So why do you think and where do you think all this comes from? It all comes from Jerusalem. It all comes from much further north. In this case, a thousand miles further north. Petra is 600 miles further north. Jerusalem is 1,000 miles further north from Mecca. Nothing new under the sun. We're now finding exactly how Islam really was recreated. It was a recreation of what had already been. Would you not say that? We're looking at a take. Uh, the tradition that was there had to be brought down, had to be Arabized, had to take it away from Jerusalem, even take it away from Petra and bring it down as the Abbasids had to create their own narrative, their own hegemony, their own identity, and their identity was in Mecca. That's why when you look and see what's there today, these are nothing more than facsimiles, and they don't even have the right dimensions. Well done, Mel. Thank you so much. Any last say for you? Well, I think it's, it's, it's pretty obvious now that what you had originally was a fertile crescent religion that was transferred, transposed, down into Arabia Deserta. It does not make sense for it to have started in an uninhabited place with no cultural influences whatsoever, almost no population. It clearly all happened up north. We've seen that again and again, no matter what topic we've looked at, the common theme is it's all up north and that's where we find the origins of Islam. There you go. And that's it makes my... sense it's all up north because that's where the civilizations were. And that is where the history is. That's where all the coins are. That's where all the, the rock inscriptions are. That's where all the buildings are. That's where everything takes place because that's where people lived. You only have these traditions where people lived. You only have these traditions where people went. And that's why it's so nice and so easy. Uh, I, I, I was even find fascinated that they didn't even know that Abraham lived in Mecca according to the traditions. According to their tradition, they had him way down a thousand miles too far south and didn't even know that this was a problem until I said, stop and think. How could Abraham be way down there? How could Abraham be in a deserted place? What in the world was he doing and coming to visit Hagar and I thought the guy had traveled 600 miles. No, he hadn't traveled 600 miles. He actually lived there. He had his own house there. He had rebuilt the Kaaba there, which means he grew up there, which means you can start to think and it just makes your head swirl. What, how? 
absolutely ahistorical this Islam is. They should never have tried to borrow something that was so intrinsically valuable and so intrinsically historical and so intrinsically based on everything we know. And the archaeology supports almost everything the Bible says. If you're going to take on the Bible historically and archaeologically and geographically and theologically and try to reproduce everything down a thousand miles further south, be careful what you touch, because we won't argue the rocks will cry out for us, and the rocks are doing just that. It's the rocks that are crying out for us. It's the archaeological evidence that's coming to light. It's all the inscriptions and all the documents and all the coins and all the, uh, in this case, even the buildings. It's so good. It's so easy. And it's made our job that much easier. God bless you. I really wish you would go on vacation. And you're exhausting <laughs> all of us because we would hope that you get some rest because you've done such a great job, Mel. Thanks for really embellishing and helping what Paul's doing. Paul's going to come back and do a few more with me. We know Joe's going to be coming back and eventually Murad will be coming as well. God bless you. It's great to have you on the team. And thanks for today. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>